The Tom Woods Show, episode 1207. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Friends, my Away carry-on helps make my travel a pleasure. It's super strong yet lightweight, and it's even got its own USB charger built in. I'm like the king of the airport with this thing. Take $20 off your suitcase order when you head to awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods at checkout. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Pat Buchanan is with me today. I should tell you that in the background you may hear some sounds of the city because I'm recording this from a hotel room in New York. I'm up here yet again, visiting friends and having a nice time. I've got two of my daughters with me. So you may hear some sounds that, well, make the episode a little bit more authentic. But in any case, we got Pat Buchanan here. I want to talk to him about what's going on with Trump and Russia. What would a Pat Buchanan presidency look like in this situation, faced with these kinds of problems? How would Pat handle these things? How does he recommend Trump proceed? Pat is just a good advice giver on top of being a just a brilliant guy overall. He's a good advice giver. He's a good counselor, well, in political situations, no doubt, but also on just a just a human level. Uh, there was a time when I was really being hit from all sides, and I had dinner with Pat, and he gave me good advice. And when he used to work at MSNBC, people would come up to him and say, Pat, what should I do about X or Y? <laughs> they just knew that he was a smart guy when it came to stuff like that. Of course, Pat served in three White Houses, Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. He was more or less the founding host of a couple of the talk shows I used to watch when I was growing up in the 1980s. He ran for president several times, was the winner of the New Hampshire primary in 1996, New York Times bestselling author. In particular, you should check out his extraordinary book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. I'm sure you can get some of Pat's books on audiobook, and you can get a free audiobook when you check out the Audible offer at TomWoodsAudio.com. Pat, welcome back. Delighted to be here, Tom. All right, Pat, let's start right here. I need to know in your heart of hearts, do you think there is anything at all to Russiagate, even something minor? Well, I think there's no question about it that the Russians hacked into the DNC and uh, Podesta emails and that they moved them through to WikiLeaks, as we've been told many times they did. I accept that, and I also accept the fact that the Trump folks uh, called a meeting with the Russians uh, who promised dirt on Hillary Clinton, and so I think that happened. Uh, But do I think that Donald Trump colluded in the whole process of stealing the emails he or his campaign? No, I don't. What do you say to people who come back and say, but look at all these indictments where there's smoke, there must be fire? Well, I would agree. Look, if you had a... If you had some kind of connection where Donald Trump or his his family or senior members of his staff were dealing with the Russians and were told by the Russians and assisted the Russians in hacking these materials and then told the Russians where they would uh, where they should put their efforts in the campaign, I think you would have a clear case of collusion. I don't know whether that is a crime or not. I don't believe it is. On that, I think Rudy is correct. But I do think it would be something deplorable and something to be condemned. And I think Mueller would probably send it over to the House uh, Judiciary Committee if the Democrats win, or even if they don't win, to look at for a matter of, for an article of impeachment. Uh, but I don't think that's been proven yet. So I think what we're getting into now is all this Michael Cohen stuff with the, uh, with the, with the lack of truth-telling And I think that's also problematic, but as long as people tell the truth when they're under oath or when they're talking to the FBI or when they're talking to a congressional committee, I don't see any criminal criminal problems on the part of uh, the the president of the United States. Trump just makes me crazy. Sometimes he'll do something everybody loves, like the Syria strike, and it makes me crazy, or he does things that make everybody upset, and I actually think half of them wind up being sort of okay. But the bellicosity toward Iran is just awful. So I wouldn't say I'm in his camp, and yet at the same time, the creepy spooks who are against him and who are conspiring against him are just off the table too. Anyway, I guess what I want to ask you is, do you think he's in trouble, and is he in more trouble now than he was, say, 18 months ago? 
well, 18 months ago, he was um, he was elected, and uh, I, my view then was that he was not in tr- in the kind of trouble he is in today. He's got a lot of problems. A lot of these things have matured, and I agree with you with regard to Iran, especially. And the, the reason I do is that well, Trump used even rougher language, I believe, on North Korea, and then stepped back from it to negotiate with him and go meet him in Singapore. With Iran, you've got a lot of people in this city. I mean, this is the, many of the never Trumpers and the anti Trumpers who despise the president would be delighted to have the United States go to war against Iran. And that war could very well bring down the president they detest, and it's the war they would like. And there's very powerful forces in this city. And, of course, in the Middle East, Israel, the Saudis, the United Arab Republic, uh, many of the Sunni nations over there. The uh, the lobby back here in D.C., many Republicans are openly hostile to Iran and would have no qualms about uh, a military clash. I think uh, Bolton and uh, Pompeo have both been on record pretty much as saying we'd like regime change in Iran. So I'm very concerned about that, and I was sort of delighted when Trump again reversed himself and said I'd be willing to talk to the Iranian leader, leaders anytime, anywhere. But I agree with you when... Uh, the president has a way of uh, of using bellicose rhetoric uh, that seems sometimes really over the top and almost uh, and da- dangerously at uh, moving toward producing the war I don't think he wants. Pat, I've long said that what Trump needs right now, frankly, is you. He needs a Pat Buchanan speech. Now, there can't be a paper trail, so you can't He can't cut you a check for this. You're just going to have to do it for patriotic reasons. But he needs a speech written by a skilled wordsmith that he delivers from the Oval Office directly to the American people, where he's communicating to them not through tweets, but through a systematic address in which he lays out precisely what's happening and the forces arrayed against him. Now, why am I wrong about that? Well, I think because the next morning there would be a tweet that might contradict what was in the speech. (laughs) <laughs> okay, fair enough, but you'd roll the dice on that, wouldn't you? Look, yeah, but uh, you know, I did write some st- statements, and some of them, incidentally, during Watergate, uh, one of the famous big May twenty second statements. It all turned out to be true, except for except for participation of some kind in the cover up. But uh, I think uh, the point is, I'm not sure right now. This is why I'm I'm one of those who believes that uh, Donald Trump should not sit down with a special prosecutor. He should not be interviewed. He should not accept any subpoena to go before a grand jury. And he should tell Mueller, look, uh, move ahead with what you're going to do, indict or not indict. I don't think a president can be indicted while in office. But do what you're going to do, indict whom you're going to indict, and then send your product of what you've done up to the House Judiciary Committee and to the House of Representatives, and we'll deal with it there. Because I think Trump has a, a tendency, more than a tendency, really to speak off the, the top of his head and to one day contradict what he said the day previous. And that's not a good situation to be in if you're sitting before a grand jury and someone like Mueller knows the answers to, to the test you'll be given and you've got to get 100% on the test to avoid a perjury trap. So this would be my view is let Mueller go ahead and proceed with what he's doing. Don't fire him and let him produce his report and let Rosenstein send it up to the Hill and let this play out. But uh, again, I don't think a a one one day speech in in the Oval Office, especially if you don't know all the details or can't recall all the details of how many meetings you had, et cetera. I don't know that that's a good idea. Do you think there really is something to the deep state and the idea that the deep state is moving against him, or is that overwrought? No, I I, th- I think it it is not overwrought. There are people. Look, the I mean, in in the in the in the federal bureaucracy, uh, I mean, Donald Trump got four percent of the vote in Washington D.C. In the federal government, he probably got the same share of the vote. People are against him, and there are people in power, obviously, Brennan and others, who are using their power to bring about, to prevent his election, I think. You take a look at the fact that uh, James Comey of the FBI and Mr. McCabe of the FBI and Mr. Orr of the FBI, whose wife is working for Fusion GPS, which had hired a British spy who's working with Russians, 
and Mr. Stroke who's, and Lisa Page, they've indicated their complete hostility uh, to Donald Trump as candidate and as president. I think there's no question that there's a deep hostility to the president of the United States and the bureaucracy. And this is, uh, this is the fount and source of all these hostile leaks and negative leaks. And the press in this town, I've never seen a press more overtly hostile to a president in my lifetime for such a sustained period of time. So I think there, there is an establishment here and a media, political, bureaucratic elite here. People know each other. Uh, you can, you mean one, if you went to the White House correspondence dinner as a conservative, you can sense it. <laughs> Well, there's no doubt that the hostility toward him is without precedent. Uh, you've never seen anything like it, and I've certainly never seen anything like it. It's frankly quite astonishing. My question is, suppose it's a President Buchanan, and you're dealing with this situation. You're faced with unprecedented opposition. You've got frankly, sinister people trying to bring you down from within and without. How does a President Buchanan proceed, let's say, differently from how President Trump is proceeding? Well, I think uh, Trump is more, Trump is much more confrontational. He's more obstreperous, if you can want to use that term. Uh, he's, uh, he's in your face. He's a fighter. He gets up every morning and fights back. Uh, he's given to hyperbole, et cetera. You know, I just uh, I just don't think that you know there's sort of a uh, a, a way of. I mean, I worked happily or not happily, contentiously, I would say, in the for you know eight and a half nine years with Richard Nixon and two years with Ronald Reagan and a brief period with Ford inside White Houses, where many, if not most, of the individuals there uh, probably disagreed with you. Most of them would have been, especially under Nixon centrist moderate republicans and who were not big fans of goldwater conservatives so you've got a a certain certain way to to uh, to conduct yourselves but let me say this i admire trump very much in terms of his confrontational attitude his refusal to back down his uh, his in your face attitude uh, the fight he exhibits uh, so in all these areas, sometimes is it overdone? Is it what I would do? No. I mean, we're two different people, but frankly, I'm talking to Tom Woods and he's in the Oval Office. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's interesting at a time like this to go back and listen once again to people like Jeb Bush lecturing him that you can't insult your way to the White House. And yet it seems like that's pretty much what the guy did. <laughs> Well, this is one thing, once again, and it's one thing I wrote about is what I've told fellows who are liberal friends of mine, I was sitting down with them, and I said something inside me, Trump issued some <laughs> insulting, blistering attack on the liberal establishment, and it was, you know, over the top, and I found myself inadvertently, I was applauding, I was cheering, there's something inside of Folks, you know, basically, I think, who are fundamentally middle American, who have been waiting and waiting for people to stand up and slap down these people who are in power and who believe they're, they're there by natural right and who believe they're the custodians of the nation. And that, uh, you know, outsiders, you can come in temporarily, maybe as long as you do our bidding, and we keep going in a certain direction. And uh, and Trump stood, he stands up to them and he fights back and he doesn't back down and he doesn't apologize. I mean, this is one thing that's always bothered me is that everybody that makes a foot fault verbally around this town has got to give it up and, and, you know, make a full confession and get absolution from the establishment. Let me take just a minute to mention, I already said that I was in New York while recording this. So... What does that mean? It means, of course, I brought with me my Away carry-on, which is my favorite suitcase in the world. When you glide it through the airport, it's like it's gliding on a cloud. There are 360-degree spinner wheels. There are four of them. It's also super lightweight, super durable. It's got a TSA-approved combination lock at the top. It's got a removable laundry bag to separate your dirty clothes from your clean clothes. If you're an overpacker like me, you're going to love the built-in compression system. I think it's a miracle what I'm able to pack into this thing. 
And my daughters who are here in the hotel room with me as I'm saying this can attest that I am sitting here with my away carry-on and that it is indeed my favorite suitcase. And if I can't find it, I'm always panicked. How am I going to go on a trip without my away suitcase? And how about this? For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods during checkout. That's $20 off a suitcase when you visit awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods during checkout. Pat, let me ask you a technical question. We've mentioned the leaks that Trump has had to deal with. And in fact, shortly after he was elected, it seemed like everything was getting leaked. How, as a practical matter, do you deal with leaks? You know, I I think one thing you've got to get is, uh, and I think we did have it um, more in the Nixon White House and in the the Reagan White House, uh, is that frankly, your people didn't leak as much. They didn't leak as much, but there's the difference, Tom, is this. I mean, as Nixon, we used to tell Nixon in 68, you know, sir, you got um, you got two deadlines in a day, the morning paper, the evening paper, and the network news is the evening paper. And so you only need to make two headlines a day so you don't have to constantly be in the news. If you get two good stories campaigning in a day, that's all you need, and then you relax and don't do like you did in 1960. Now you've got all these you got websites, you've got uh, these, uh, you know, the cable TV 24-7, you've got all these correspondents, you've got a much more hostile and adversarial attitude in the White House press corps than you even had when we had Donaldson and under Nixon, and rather in the others under, under Nixon, excuse me, and Donaldson under Reagan. Uh, and so it's, you know, I don't know how you stop it when you got phone calls coming into all these all these folks, and then you've got a very disputatious uh, White House, and you've got a president who tends to uh, be fairly intolerant of what he's in and gets tired of AIDS and the rest of it. So I think it's you know the the situation is different, and the White House is different both. It's just we are in a new world. Pat, I'd like you to paint a picture for me of the Democratic Party as you see it today. I see some triumphalist conservatives who seem to think the Democrats are imploding. These are the same people, everything they cherish winds up getting smashed and degraded and destroyed, and they still write books called Why We're Winning. I don't know, there's something wrong with these people. But they see something that I don't see. They're claiming that the Democrats are really suffering and, and in trouble. What do you see? Well, I think the Democrats are going to have a good fall. I think you've got a lot of energy and fire in the Democratic Party, and the hostility to Trump is just palpable. And so what I think you're going to get is you're going to get a very energetic turnout uh, this fall for the Democrats, and I think it's going to result in major gains in the House. I don't know how big, but it's conceivable to me we could lose the House. Uh, But I think that... uh, that basically in the Democratic Party, one of the hopeful signs is, I see real signs of McGovernism in the Democratic Party. After Humphrey lost, a lot of the liberal Democrats were on the streets in Chicago, maybe not that far out, but the ones who were for Bobby Kennedy and Gene McCarthy and George McGovern at the convention, uh, you know, they changed the rules and they went to work. My friend Rick Stearns and others, they went to work to get these states, non-primary states, and organize them well. And they took over the party. And this is where the energy and fire is today, I think, in the Democratic Party. It's very anti-Trump. There's a strong socialist trend. There's Among the millennials, there's not this automatic recoil to socialism and these ideas, you know, um, full tuition free and Medicare for all. And some of these ideas, I think, are probably going to help some of the candidates in the Democratic primaries. And I don't see the Democratic Party uniting around, you know, good old Joe Biden. And so I think some of these, if you somebody could break out, I think, and you could get a real leftist nominated, which is a possibility for a reelection of Trump. Right. So in other words, Trump should hope for that much more than he should hope for, say, a Biden nomination. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. I think a Biden nomination depends on where he is. And, well, frankly, it also is going to depend on a lot of things. Like if we have a war with Iran, uh, you know, I think that could do to the Republican Party what uh, Bush's war in 
Afghanistan and Iraq eventually did to the Republican Party in 2006 and 2008. Um, and I think it would be just a massive, just not only a distraction, but the American people, they might cheer it in its first weeks or months, but I think they'd sour on it very quickly as all its consequences came in. So that's what my fear, and the one thing, you know, I was all for Trump in, in terms of his economic patriotism and his border security and putting his own country first and getting out of these wars, but I've always been leery of that, um, of the Iranian thing because there's the resistance to it is so thin back here in D.C. Well, the trouble is he has not exactly surrounded himself with people you and I might prefer. I will say, <laughs> Brother John Bolton. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And because his own knowledge of these subjects is itself thin, that means he winds up relying on some truly ghastly people. But let's talk about 2020 and what's happening there. It's true that the millennials are trending toward so-called democratic socialism, but the trouble with the millennials, as with every younger generation, is that they don't vote. So that's a problem for people who support that wing of the party. At the same time, it seems to me that the old guard in the Democratic Party is not just going to lie down and let this happen. Uh, surely people like uh, Biden and even Pelosi must view this as an uprising that's frankly directed against them. Sure. And I think, well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe Nancy Pelosi, even if the Democrats win, will be Speaker of the House. I mean, what way the party would go back to Pelosi and uh, Steny Hoyer is an old buddy of mine, but, you know, Steny's almost my age. And uh, you get these in Joe Biden, you get somebody going to nominate somebody who's late 70s who's older than Trump is and who's known as a sort of a moderate liberal, et cetera. Um, I think the, the energy and fire in the Democratic Party, that's not where it's at. And I think they, my guess would be they're going to, they'll rally around some candidate the way last time they rallied around Bernie. And if it hadn't been for Hillary, Bernie might have gotten that nomination. And the fact that Hillary lost as she did has really energized these folks. So again, uh, again, you know, it's, it's hard to predict, hard, but I'll, I'm one of those. I saw an article somewhere the other day, and I, I've talked to people before. I think Trump might be well off if he lost the House. You know the the fire the fire fiery folks in the Democratic Party they might just start let's move and let's impeach him, and then you start that big battle and then you got a Democratic House which is obstructionist you can blame them for everything, and so uh, it not it might not be a bad situation you know we got to keep the Senate for the court because that's the third branch of government is at stake. Pat, let's circle back to the Russia story just for a minute. There's part of that story that just doesn't quite mesh with the overall narrative. Well, when you're on Facebook and Twitter, and I know you have accounts there, but surely you're not managing them yourself, and God bless you for that, but for those of us who are on there actively, we see a lot of people saying, oh, Trump is in the pocket of the Russians. But when you leave all that aside and you dispassionately examine Trump's Russia policy, would you describe that as a conciliatory policy? No, I don't think it is. I do think this. I think Trump wants to have a better relationship with the Russians. And I think Trump wants to uh, pull back from any kind of confrontation with Russia. But good heavens, the resistance to that in this town among the Russophobic elements in the media and in politics, the hostility and hatred of Putin as though, I mean, Stalin never got a beating like this. And nothing compared to it. it. It astounds me. I think that Trump is, I mean, to a degree, is having to accommodate this tendency in his own party. For example, sending the, the Javelin missiles to Ukraine. I thought that was a terrible mistake. If the Ukrainians start up that war again, they'll get beaten, and there'll be a demand that we get in. You know, I think that, I think in, in the Russian thing, Trump is, frankly, because of what, I don't, you know, believe they, people say they've got something on him or blackmail or something like this. I think Trump feels that, as, as I do in a way, that basically in the, in the future world coming, that Russia is essentially a part of the West. The Christian Orthodox Russia and Protestant and Catholic Europe and the United States, that's where, that's where it all belongs, even though we're secularizing like crazy. 
So, but I've always felt once the Cold War was over, we didn't have a great natural quarrel with Russia. It was mainly ideological and imperial. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Back when they actually had gulags, it seems like people were a lot more blasé about Russia than they are now. Sure, I mean, in 1933, FDR recognized recognized Stalin's regime at the very moment that the, that horror was going on in Ukraine with millions and millions starved to death. And when, what was it, uh, the Russian ambassador showed up here in the United States, the new ambassador, people were, it was a wonderful move by Stalin. They cheered him on. All of these, I mean, in, in, in the Stalin's, the murders and massacres were just pulling up. I've got a line in one of my books, a, a foreign policy book, and I got it from a historian, and and he said, you know, as a big, by 1931, excuse me, 1939, September 1st, Stalin's victims outnumbered Hitler's a thousand to one before the war started. I mean, this was a a monster. He was always a monster until exceeded by the guy I wrote toasts about in Beijing, Mao Zedong. One of my friends on Facebook took one of those famous pictures of Churchill, FDR, and Stalin, and wrote on it the original Russian collusion. (laughs) Listen, let me tell you, exactly, in my book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Necessary War, read about, uh, I mean, Churchill's trips to, to he went to Moscow in 42, and then they were in Tehran in 43, and then they go to, they go to uh, Yalta in 45, and and all the rest of it, and and Churchill was giving away all of Europe to him. FDR said, look, uh, don't let it out that I'm giving you Poland until after the 44 election because it'll hurt me in the Middle West. I mean, unbelievable what these people did in terms of collusion with Stalin. A real monster. And what is, uh, and compared to this, you got Putin, who's a colonel in the KGB. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we can handle this guy. Pat, are you working on a book project these days that you're at liberty to tell us about? No, I'm not working on a book project right now. I think... As I told somebody, I think I've said what I came to say. (laughs) Well, I sure appreciate those columns that you're writing, and I certainly hope the White House is reading them, particularly the ones pertaining to Iran. Folks, make sure you check out Pat at Buchanan.org. Read his columns. You'll know what's going on in the world. Pat, I genuinely appreciate your time today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. Take it easy. All right, folks, that's it for today. Now, I dismiss all of you who are not interested in online business or who don't have an online business. But if you do, I do want to tell you about something that it's true I get compensated for and I want you to know that. But I want to tell you about it because I genuinely believe it will make your life easier. You know that I give away free ebooks. Have I mentioned that here on the show? And to get the ebook, you have to go to a landing page and enter your email address. Then your email address gets taken over to my email marketing platform, and then you get emailed the book. And then I have a couple of membership sites you know, where you have a username and a password. So I have software for that. I have a mobile app over at libertyclassroom.com. I got websites. I got all these different moving parts, and every single one of them is on a different platform. So I need to make sure that the email marketing platform is talking to the landing page platform and that when there's a problem, I know which one is the problem and one company doesn't blame the other. And it can be annoying to deal with, not to mention the bills I pay. I pay for my two email lists close to $300 a month just to have those lists. So you see, that's my daughter in the background here in the hotel room. She couldn't believe how much I spent on my email list. So there's that. I spent $500 a year with lead pages to get all those landing pages that I use. I spend, uh, I don't know, probably $120 a year on my membership software. Oh, so in other words, all these different sorts of things, and they're all different, and you got to integrate them, and you got to pay uh, an arm and a leg for each one of them. But there's a way to get all this on one platform that also saves you a lot of dough. It basically costs you like one mediocre steak dinner a month. And you get everything I just described and a whole lot more. I've never seen anything like it. I promoted this last year and my people absolutely loved it. Not a single complaint. Everybody loved it. All the stuff you need for your online business on one platform. So there's no, you know, the this bone's connected to the that bone and this has got to communicate with that. It's all one platform. So no problems there. And it's way, way, way cheaper. Now, it's too late for me to unplug from all the services I'm plugged into. But save yourselves. It's not too late to save yourself. So check it out at TomWoods.com slash everything. It's a platform called Builderall, and I think it's great. 
and you should take advantage of it because you will maintain your mental health and you'll keep your wallet intact. Uh, that is to say, it'll be uh, a lot fuller after you check out Builderall. So you can get that over at tomwoods.com slash everything, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.